In my previous lectures on the Filioque controversy and the doctrine of perichoresis, I dealt with questions that pertain to the imminent trinity, that is, to how the divine persons relate to one another in eternity. In my view, though, the goal of Trinitarian theology shouldn't be to understand God in God's self, but to understand how God is God for us, that is, the economic trinity. The thing about that is that we can't really understand the economic trinity fully unless our idea of it is informed by an understanding of the imminent trinity. We only truly comprehend what it means for God to be God for us when we apprehend who God is in God's self. It's only when we understand who the Son and the Holy Spirit are as persons in themselves that we fully understand who these persons sent to us by the Father are. But wait, you might say, isn't it true that we can only know the imminent trinity from the economy of salvation, from God's work in the world? Yes, and in fact, this is not a paradox. We begin with what you might call the raw data of the economy of salvation. From the revelatory saving acts of the one God in his Son and his Holy Spirit, we conclude that God in God's self must be a trinity. If God were not truly Trinitarian, then revealing God's self as Trinitarian would not be a revelatory act on God's part. It would be misleading. But once we understand that God is eternally, internally triune, we can turn our minds back to the economy of salvation and truly grasp the economic trinity for the first time. Now, the doctrine of the economic trinity is built around the missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're called missions from the Latin word for being sent, because the Father sends the Son and the Spirit into the world. But when the Son and the Spirit are sent, they don't stop being the persons they are in eternity. On the contrary, the movements of the Son and the Spirit going out from the Father within the Godhead are called processions, and as Thomas Aquinas astutely says, a divine mission is nothing other than a divine procession with the addition of a created effect. That is to say, when Jesus is born and walks around and eats and sleeps and preaches and works miracles and is crucified, all of that is happening on top of him being eternally begotten from the Father. When the Holy Spirit falls on the church at Pentecost, when she leads the church, dispenses spiritual gifts to the body of Christ, etc., all of that is happening on top of her eternally proceeding from or being spirated by the Father. So again, the Son's and the Spirit's missions are their processions with something added on. And if that's the case, then we do well to ask this. The generation of the Son is what makes him the distinct person he is within the imminent trinity, and the spiration of the Spirit is what makes her the distinct person she is within the imminent trinity. So what is distinct about each of them in the economic trinity? Do the Son and the Spirit respectively have a proper mission, that is, a mission that belongs specifically to that one person? When we set out to answer this question, we need to keep one thing in mind from the beginning. A long tradition in Trinitarian thinking holds that all of the Trinity's works in the world are undivided. Any operation performed by one of the Trinitarian persons is performed by all of them. Of course, the rationale here is pretty clear. If any one of the divine persons could act independently of the other two, it would be difficult to maintain that they're all one God. In fact, one of the key pro-Nicene arguments that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit did not make for three gods was precisely that whatever they do, they do in common. The action beginning from the Father, moving through the Son, and being completed in the Holy Spirit. Traditionally, then, it's been asserted that we shouldn't assign any activity to uh, one of the divine persons exclusively. 
If we say, for example, that the Father is our Creator, the Son is our Redeemer, or that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, we can't take those statements to mean that the Son and the Holy Spirit don't take part in creation, or that the Father is, uh, or that the Father and the Holy Spirit don't take part in redemption, or that the Father and the Son don't take part in sanctifying us. The practice of associating a given activity with a given person, say, associating the Father with creation, that practice is called appropriation. It's justified to appropriate creation to the Father because he is indeed the source of all things, including the Son and the Holy Spirit. But in truth, the Father isn't exclusively the Creator. Likewise, it's justified to appropriate redemption to the Son because of the work of Christ. But the Father sent him to do that work, and the Spirit empowered him to do it. I can make the same point about the Spirit as sanctifier, but you get the point. We have to remember this stuff when we talk about a proper mission of the Son or a proper mission of the Spirit, a mission that belongs specifically to one of them. Yet, we have an equally important point to consider as well. It is true of only one divine person that he became incarnate. Jesus Christ is not all three persons of the Trinity. The Son, and only the Son, became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, the Father and the Holy Spirit equally took part in bringing about the Incarnation, so the Son was not acting independently of them. But the fact that He alone identified Himself in His person with a human nature, that's enough to make it necessary to speak of a proper mission of the Son. Having established this, we need to go on to ask whether there's a proper mission of the Holy Spirit as well. Is there anything that the Spirit does in redemption that's uniquely the work of the Spirit? I think that there is, and a really good argument to that effect has been made by a theologian named David Coffey. According to Coffey, what's distinctive about the respective missions of the Son and the Spirit is the kinds of union that they enter into with created reality. The Son enters into a hypostatic union with a created human nature. In Jesus Christ, he's one hypostasis, or person, with two natures. By contrast, the Holy Spirit unites herself to human beings who are persons in their own right, without supplanting their personhood. It's the difference between incarnation as a human being and indwelling an already existing human being. But the Spirit's mission is oriented to the Son's mission, just as her eternal procession from the Father is oriented to the Son's eternal procession. Now, the very reason that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are redemptive for us is because he is both divine and human. Because he's divine, he is able to do what no mere human being could have done for us. Because he's human, he does it as one of us. And we reap the fruit of his work because our humanity is joined to his. Why? That question brings us to the mission of the Spirit and how it's united or oriented to the Son's mission. To come back to David Coffey's argument, there are two aspects of this to pay attention to. First, the reason the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us is so that by uniting us to herself, she can unite us to the Son, through whom we are in turn united to the Father. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, or makes us holy, precisely by uniting us to Christ, in whom we become adopted sons and daughters of the Father, being forgiven of our sins and made to be new creatures. I've previously mentioned the idea that the Spirit eternally rests on the Son, that she abides in Him or dwells in Him as the Father's love for Him and that it's in the Spirit that the Son eternally returns the Father's love. With this in mind, we can say that the Spirit dwells in us, making us sons and daughters in the Son, because she dwells in the Son. 
And because she dwells in us and unites us to the Son, we, like the Son, receive the Father's love in the Spirit, and we, like the Son, love the Father in return. We can see, then, that the missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit reflect who they eternally are as distinct persons intimately related to one another. And in this way, we can see that the economic trinity is a reflection of the imminent trinity. As I said before, the very reason for understanding the imminent trinity is so that we can understand the nature of what God does for us in the economy of salvation. It's my sincere hope that this understanding will bring us all a greater joy in the God by whom we are created, redeemed, and sanctified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May it be so. Amen.